I'm Jules Holland. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm so pleased to be invited to give this talk about a dear old friend, the piano. In this fireside chat, we'll discover where the piano comes from, where it gets its name and how to attack it. I'll be giving you a back of the fag packet history of the instrument, some practical and safety tips and illustrations of style that I like. For instance, I like the blues. <laughs> clavichord and harpsichord were like the mum and dad, even the nan and grandad, of our modern day piano. The bouffant-haired geniuses of the 17th century had these at their disposal. Johann Sebastian Bach, one of the greatest geniuses ever, had one of these at his home to write on. When keyboards came out, they became the arranger's and composer's perfect tool. Why? Because they were polyphonic, meaning you could play as many notes at once as you wanted. On a monophonic instrument, like a flute or a trumpet, you can only play one note at a time. But with a keyboard, the writer has unlimited scope for exploring chords, harmony and the mysteries of the universe. The keys are laid out so you can see how music works, playing one note, then two, then three, you create a chord, change the inversion, change the chord, unlimited possibilities. At home right now, where you're sitting, you might not be aware of it, but you, yes, you, are in possession of a 10-piece orchestra. They are called fingers. And when they connect with a keyboard, the possibilities are endless. Now, clavichords, like many early instruments, can be beautifully decorated. This one is inscribed in Latin, which translated says, in life I was silent, in death I sing. This refers to the timber the instrument is made of. When it was a living tree, it was silent, but once it was chopped down, died and made into this, it sang. Another unique feature was this, like a guitar, you could make the clavichord play with vibrato, like so. So, all in all, you might be thinking, clavichord, great, yes please, I want one. But not so fast, because despite all these super options and extras, it was not a dynamic instrument. That means, no matter how hard or soft you hit the keys, the volume never changes. And there was no sustain pedal to let the notes ring on. So, the boffins figured this out and then they bred their 18th century high-tech ideas with the clavier and the harpsichord. And this resulted in the darling little piano being born. 
and it changed everything. Because the piano is a percussive instrument, it has a sustain pedal. When you press it, the sound rings on after your hands have left the keys. It's also a dynamic instrument. This means if you hit it hard and fast, it becomes louder. But if you touch it gently, it's softer and quieter. The musical term for this is pianissimo. And for this, is forte. So this is where the piano gets its name, the piano forte. And in no time at all, these wonderful instruments all across the world, all across Europe, in every city, in every street, in the front rooms, the saloon bars, the churches, the brothels, the palaces, the concert halls. A hundred years ago, there were more pianos than motor cars. When it was invented, the piano changed everything. But the musical bigwigs of the day said, with all its dynamics and pedals, it was much too forgiving to be a proper instrument. So any idiot could play it. On hearing that, I decided to take it up. This is the piano that I learned on. Now, when any of this reflect on the path that brought us to where we are today, we might remember an incident or a random set of fortunate circumstances that have led us into our career and our lives. Well, without this piano in my life, I wouldn't have had a life in music and I wouldn't be here now talking to you. My great grandmother, Britannia Powell, helped get this piano as a wedding gift for her daughter and son-in-law. <laughs> George and Rosie Lane in 1930. They were a big family and the piano had pride of place in the small tidy front room of their terraced house in Greenwich. The front room reserved for birthdays or Christmases when the family and friends would have knees ups and sing songs where everyone had their own song. So the piano was always centre stage. My grandmother and her sisters played the piano they played the old music hall songs. I always particularly like the one they did, There's a look in your eye that attracts me, If only my dear, you had two, which always appealed to me as a child, and the popular songs of the day. But if a tune was a bit too tricky, you could always get Fats Waller to play it for you. spreads across Europe all the way to the end of My Nan Street, which on June the 18th, 1944, is blitzed. The blast of a doodle bug knocks out the front room window, curtains on fire, smoke, flames, shattered glass, scorch this side of our dear old friend. Fortunately, Nan, before ushering the family into the air raid shelter, had shut the lid. So the sheen on the inside and the keys were discovered to be undamaged. And miraculously, it still played all right. Then at last, in 1945, when peace came and all Europe was celebrating, this piano was lifted out 
and taken onto the road to be the centre of a VE Day street party. Neighbours lent on it, singing songs, no doubt with a pint of beer, singing songs of love and joy, looking forward to the dawn of a peaceful new day. But no doubt, as the sun set and the evening wore on, for other folk, the piano's jangling melodies became the distant soundtrack to a dark night of passion. What I'm trying to explain is that even before I was born or laid my grubby little fingers on its lovely keys, this piano had an extraordinary story to tell and how the music played on it entwined with people's lives on special occasions. In to the swinging 60s. into coming, but not so fast in Greenwich, as can be seen in this 1961 photograph of me and my Uncle David in the front garden just outside the room with this piano in it. About five years after this photograph was taken, around 66, 67, I hear my uncle playing this brilliant music in the front room. It goes something like this. <laughs> in love with it straight away. He showed me this left hand. I became obsessed with learning the boogie and have spent the rest of my life trying to figure it out. By strange coincidence, I discovered that it was also the first thing that Ray Charles learned on the piano and the same thing Dr. John was first taught by his Aunt Mimi. A repetitive pulse going from major to minor. for the first time, this left hand might be a place to start, but only if you love the sound of it. If not, find something you do love the sound of, because in my experience you can only learn by playing the music that you love. Further, what I learned from Dr John and Ray Charles was that as a professional, to connect with an audience you have to play what you love and love what you play, but also you have to mean what you play and play what you mean. Every note must be played with conviction and the right intention. Learning music is like learning a language. You'll pick up the accent and expressions of who you enjoy listening to. When you begin, you want to sound like the people you love, but ultimately you're going to sound like you. And that's no bad thing, because with practice, this is how you end up with your own style. In a moment, I'm gonna play in the style of some of the piano players I love and who have inspired me. I don't claim to be an expert in any style except my own. And I'm pretty mystified by that. But I hope hearing one of these will make you want to discover more about one of the artists I talk about and I illustrate in my own stuff. Now, New Orleans is a port, and a city that has docks will also have a mash-up of cultures. And that's what you hear in New Orleans-style piano. Creole, African, Caribbean, French, Spanish, Latin and English things all mashing up together to create its own style. You may have heard of the Red Hot Peppers, and they were, of course, a trailblazing group led by one of the piano greats and jazz inventors of the 1920s, Jelly Roll Morton. What a great name, Jelly Roll Morton.
Jelly Roll Morton's Whining Boy Blues. It's worth looking up some of these people because they also had amazing lives as well as being amazing piano players. We move on into the 1950s and Professor Longhair comes along. The great Professor Longhair. He invents a wonderful style. It's admired and embraced by Alan Toussaint, uh, James Booker, Dr John and me. <laughs> Professor Longhair, of course, went on to influence a lot of people. Dr. John was one of them, and he was my dear friend. He was a fantastic composer, singer, producer, guitarist, but most of all, he's remembered for his unique rolling piano style. music has its roots in European folk music. Let's go back to the big wigs for just a moment, Beethoven, and let's face it, you don't get any bigger wit than that great genius. The third movement of his pastoral symphony was entitled A Merry Gathering of Country Folk. Inspired by hearing the fiddle music of country dancing, he uses lots of fourths and fifths. by country people for dances with a great feel. That's what gives country its modal sound. The Nashville pianist Floyd Kramer was the top man at this. He played on Elvis's early records and he later became one of the biggest selling piano instrumentalists of all time with his slip note piano style. He said he came up with it trying to copy a pedal steel guitar on the piano like so. When asked what he wanted to achieve in his own playing, band leader and drummer Gene Krupa said, I want to have a good technique and a good feel, but I don't want my feel to be limited by my lack of technique, and I don't want my technique to get in the way of my feel. Sounds rather complicated, doesn't it? What did he mean and what do we mean by technique and feel? Feel is really when people play with instinctive passion and connect the music to people's hearts and feet when they're dancing. Technique is your technical ability and understanding of your instrument and how to play it. I wrote a piece called Panic Attack and I evolved this left hand and I realised I wanted to, the left hand goes like this. Now one, you need a technique to keep playing that repetitively and then start to forget about it so the right hand can do its own thing. But as well as this, you'll see I wanted to build it up because I'd seen a concert pianist do this and play fifths instead of just the, this single note. Fifths like this realised I needed quite a technique to that. By the way, you'll hear my foot banging through some of this. I'll explain that in a bit about feel. But let me give you a bit of panic attack to show you where I needed technique to be able to play it properly. <laughs> Thank you. 
worked out so I can do this left hand now. So there's a piece that required quite a lot of technique to play, but you needed the feel to get the boogie happening. Stride piano is the other style of piano that needs, for me, quite a lot of technique. And the stride piano was really developed in Harlem in the 1920s and 30s by people like Willie the Lion Smith, Fats Waller, James P. Johnson, Donald Lambert. If you look up some of those people, you'll hear some of the best things ever. Some of the most remarkable music ever made with incredible technique, but a great swinging feel as well. You could dance to it. It had syncopation. In fact, when somebody asked Fats Waller what syncopation was, he says, if you've got to ask, you're never going to know. Now, I'm going to play a little bit of stride piano. Before I do, I should explain what you're trying to do with the stride piano is you're trying to accompany yourself so the, the left hand becomes the whole band like the guitar and the bass so you're basically going so you're becoming the whole band but instead of doing two using two hands I'm going to try and use one like so piano style of Grand Hotel, a piece that I wrote with Sting. So now we're going to discuss the arpeggio, another part of technique, another example of technique. What is the arpeggio? You take a chord like G, and you play, play the notes individually in a sequence like so, and that's an arpeggio. It's pretty, isn't it? ability to make things kind of sweet and give things a pulse. Now I wrote a piece called Brick Lane and it was quite sparse. It's not based on, I'll play a bit of it in a moment. And uh, one time for some TV show uh, we had it made into a role for a fairground organ uh, for some reason. And the, the old man who made up the role, he, he, put, he transcribed this Brick Lane and he said, Jules, that'd sound a lot prettier if you let me put an arpeggio in there. And you know, he was exactly right. I'll show you what I mean. So originally, it was this, rather sparse. sweet and then 
stride, arpeggio, all these different things are part of technique. From technique we go to feel. So feel is really when a musician has a fantastic feel. Maybe when somebody's first starting out in music they've discovered they can play a fantastic boogie riff that makes everybody dance but they don't know what the next chord is. And that's an example of having a great feel but being limited because not having a technique. So you, you know, it's a question of both. Anyway, I'm gonna give you an example here and uh, it kind of involves the arpeggio because it's this, uh, I'm gonna play this, uh, this riff that's played by lots of different people. And I'm gonna give you the example of these different people and how they make exactly the same notes sound completely different. So the notes are like these. And it's part of the piano being a rhythm section. So it's those kind of notes, and, they, and you add the, the right hand. Now, the Count Basie Orchestra, the brilliant Count Basie Orchestra, he would have been playing like the riff just like this. It was one of his favourite ways of vamping in the 40s, and then you have a key change and. Exactly the same notes were then taken, you know, maybe 20 years later, and injected again for the purposes of dance by Jerry Lee Lewis. He takes exactly the same notes, but plays them with a completely different feel, which is this. <laughs> So Jerry Lee injects something completely different into the whole thing. He probably doesn't even think about it, he's just feeling it. And that's what feel is all about. It's brilliant, this whole playing the same notes, but a different feel. But then let's take ourselves across the ocean again through the Caribbean to Kingston, Jamaica, where the Scatterlites in the early 1960s are inventing the whole form of new music, which is called ska. And in the ska style, in some of their records, they're playing exactly the same notes again, exactly the same notes, but in their feel. I've been very fortunate in my life to play music. I love playing music. And I've often played it to people. I see them dancing. I see their spirits being lifted up. And you can only get people to feel like that if you feel like that yourself. That's the beginning. Now, I, I've got quite a rare record by John Lee Hooker called Teaching the Blues. And I'm really going to just go through what he says in that because this is really, if you're just starting out, worth remembering. So first of all, he gets a riff going like this. <laughs> Feet. You'll have heard my feet throughout this. This will explain why. So you get the riff. Now he says, just get a riff, get a groove going, get the room feeling good. You don't need no chords. Throw them fancy chords away. That's what he says. Chuck them away.
Blues, with its truth and humanity, is one of the main roots of popular music we hear today. The other important African-American music that has shaped everything since is gospel music. When you hear Aretha Franklin record... <laughs> style of piano. When you hear Mildred Falls playing with Mahalia Jackson. Or Billy Preston playing with the Beatles. You're hearing the modal sound of belief. I'm going to finish with a bit of this in a moment. But before I do, you may have noticed that some of my pianistic displays have not all been on the usual shiny black Yamaha grand pianos you see me on stage or in the studio with. That's because a lot of the music I grew up with was played on these, yes, old bangers. The point is, if you've got access to a great piano, wonderful, that's really great. But like when you're learning to drive, you don't necessarily need to start with a Bentley. You start with an old banger like this. And this might be old. In fact, this one is over 90 years old. But it still does its job. A piano is one of the few things that you can own or rent these days that will last a few generations. At the moment, we're all having to self-isolate. But not all of us are isolating in the same circumstances. I'm lucky because of the piano, maybe this piano, I live in a nice place and I'm surrounded by friends. My hope is that if you've been watching this, no matter whether you're 8 or 80 years old, that you might have heard or seen something in this that will inspire you to make friends with a piano or even just to explore and discover some of the people I have mentioned and through them discover the great piano music of the world.